<coughs> okay, so uh, today's topic is classification of automorphisms, or uh, really the main point is some invariant train tracks. And I started talking about this last time. Let's see, this doesn't quite. And, and this is somehow analogous, to, if you think about matrices, for instance, instead of automorphisms of free groups, then this is analogous to the Jordan normal form. It, it's some, uh, some form that you, you, know, you get to conjugate your automorphism to some kind of a, a, a simple form where you can read off various things, like, for example, growth rate. If you, if you have a matrix that's put in the Jordan normal form, then it's easy to figure out what the growth rate is just by looking at the largest eigenvalue, largest diagonal element. Well, it's the same kind of thing for, for, these, uh, for the automorphisms. You can, you we'll, we'll be able to read off the growth rate, um, but, and then various other things that I won't get into. Um, it's also analogous to the Nielsen-Thurston classification of uh, mapping classes, if you're familiar with that. OK. Um, <coughs> so, so first, there is this definition that I made last time. So that, that if you have a, an automorphism, say, I mean, you can do this in any metric space, but uh, you're mostly interested in automorphisms of free groups. So phi, phi induces an isometry of outer space. And so we say that, uh, that phi is, uh, and yeah, that we define this number, d phi, the displacement. So this is the infimum of the distance between uh, a point gamma, graph gamma, and its image. In, in outer space. So overall gamma in CVN. Okay, so there's just some real number like this. And, uh, and, then, and then we make the definition that phi is uh, elliptic if, if d phi is equal to zero and is realized. In other words, phi has a fixed point. Uh, it's, it's hyperbolic if d phi is positive and is realized. In other words, the infimum is realized um, by, by some graph gamma. And then it's parabolic if, if uh, d phi is not realized. Wh whether it's zero or not, doesn't matter. It's not realized. OK, so you can do this in any. Metric space, and maybe if you're familiar with the hyperbolic plane, you'll, you'll see that this corresponds exactly to the classification of isometries in hyperbolic plane. And, and there, in addition, uh, parabolic uh, isometries always have d phi equal to 0. In, in outer space, that's not the case. You can have parabolic isometries with positive d phi. We'll, we'll see an example later. Um, yeah, and then. I, I started with, uh, with a simple example. This was maybe example one, that A goes to A and B goes to AB. And we observe that this is parabolic. The, the, roughly, the picture is um, that you know, in outer space of rank two, you, you, it looks like, uh, well, it really looks like a hyperbolic plane. If you ignore, if you ignore those uh, triangles attached later, they're, they're sort of irrelevant here. Um, then what happens is that this automorphism fixes one of these missing points, and it uh, it moves it, mo it it moves these uh, triangles. It rotates the triangles uh, by one unit. Yeah, each triangle goes to the next triangle around this um, missing point. And if you take a point that's close to a missing point, then its image uh, is going to be um, you know the distance between them is going to go to zero. So that, that's what we did by by calculating the, the displacement. So, th so these points can be taken to be, you know, it's a graph um, where one loop has size epsilon, and the other one is 1 minus epsilon. And then the, the, uh, the, slope, uh, the, the slope is going to be close to 1 of the, of the map that realizes the, this automorphism. OK. So we did that last time. Now I want to give you an, uh, an example of a yeah, we also observe that uh, elliptic is equivalent to um, being finite order. 
This is uh, by the Nielsen realization. So next, I, I want to give you an example of a hyperbolic automorphism, and then we'll have to uh, then, then we'll, we'll prove some kind of a structure theorem for what uh, what all hyperbolic automorphisms look like. Okay. So example two. So let's say this is phi goes a goes to b, and b goes to a b. So it's a very simple change. I'm just changing one letter here, but I claim this one is hyperbolic. So claim is that uh, the displacement here is log 1 plus square root of 5 over 2 and is uh, and phi is hyperbolic. In other words, this is realized. Okay, so how do you, how do you see that? Okay, so there's some work to, to be done. This is not obvious. Um, Okay, so, so I'm going to start with, uh, with, this, with this graph, with the rows, the one where the map is actually defined. Okay, so I, I want to, so to take uh, uh, gamma to be the rows with identity marking. Okay, but now, now we want to uh, put a metric on it. We, we have a map here, so f, f from gamma to gamma is given by this formula. So a goes to b, B goes to AB. So I, I just I have a rows and I'm sending this edge A to the edge B and B to AB. Okay, so that's a well-defined map. But now, uh, okay, so I want to choose a metric here. So step one is going to be to um, assign a metric L to gamma, so that um, so that F expands each edge by the same uh, factor lambda. In other words, the slope is constant and it's equal to lambda on both edges. OK, so how do we do this? Now, if I have a metric, then I can also scale it, and I'll get another such metric. So normalization can be done at the end. OK, so it's uh, so easier to, to uh, not worry about normalization at this point. So I could. I could uh, start by declaring that length of A is 1, OK? That's my normalization instead of the sum being 1. I can do that at the end if I want to. But then, then what should B be? So the length of B has to be equal. This B is equal to f of A, right? And so if f expands by, by a factor of lambda, then this, this would better be lambda, right? It's because A is 1, so f of A should be lambda. OK, so this a should be 1, and b should be lambda. But now, what should lambda be? So we get, we get one more equation from looking at um, the length of, length of f of b, right? The length of f of b, on, the one, on one hand, this should be equal to uh, lambda squared, right? It should be lambda times what b is, and b is lambda. So this should be lambda squared. But on the other hand, this is equal to length of a, b. Because f of b is equal to a b, and so this is one plus lambda. So, so I get an equation for lambda, right? So I have lambda squared minus lambda minus one equals zero, and so that gives me the, so lambda is there are two roots, but the negative one doesn't count. So lambda is one plus square root of five over two. Okay. So that tells me, what does that tell me? That tells me that, um, that a, um, the distance between, so the, the, the distance between this gamma, the gamma with this metric, and its image is, um, is less than or equal than um, log lambda. Right? This f is the, the kind of the, um, the difference of markings. You know, I have this outer space here, and I have, I have gamma, and I have gamma phi. 
these are two different points, but if you look at the difference of markings, right? So there is, a, there is the identity marking here. The marking here is F. I mean, it's uh, that's how the, the, the map, that's how the, the, outer, uh, outer, the outer automorphism group is acting on outer space. It changes the marking. It composes the marking by, well, by phi. Or, I mean, here phi is the same as F. Um, and so, uh, so the difference of markings is F. Okay, so, so I certainly get that. So this, this means that the, my d phi is less than or equal to log lambda. But now I have to show that it's not strictly less. Okay, now step two is going to be to, and, and maybe that's uh, somewhat surprising that, that you know, this exists, but the, uh, the, the key in improving hyperbolicity of this is some kind of a train track structure on this graph. Okay, so we want to find a train track structure on gamma uh, th th that's preserved by by f in the sense that that f sends legal loops legal paths to legal paths Okay, that's th that's our goal in step two. So such a thing exists, uh, and and it's not too hard to find it either. You, you, one way, my favorite way of finding uh, train track structures like this is to look at the derivative map. Okay, so f, what does f star do? The derivative map on the on the set of um, directions. Well, first of all, I want to give names of directions. There is a kind of a standard way. Uh, of, of naming directions. There are four directions here, right, at the vertex. There's a vertex V, and there are four directions. The, I want to call this direction A, because it, it's the beginning of the edge A. And this direction here is going to be called A inverse, or A bar, because that's the end of the edge A. And likewise, we have a B, and we have a B bar. Okay, so these are, these are the four directions. And how does the derivative of F <coughs> act on this? Well, it sends a to B. The beginning of A goes to the beginning of B, right? So A goes to B, and then uh, beginning of B goes to beginning of A. So, uh, so this B goes back to A. Okay, so that's uh, one orbit. And then we also have, yeah, what happens to A bar? This is now the end of A. Well, the end of A goes to the end of B. So A bar goes to B bar. And where does the end of B go? Well, it goes to the end of B. Right, so this is the it's kind of a diagram telling you what uh, what the derivative of f does to these four directions, and and then the, the sensible train track structure is obtained by declaring that two directions uh, are equivalent, if and only if they um, they eventually map to the same direction. So in other words, if f star of d to some power k, k some large number is equal to F star k of d prime for large k. Th this diagram is fairly simple, but you could have, um, you know, you, you could have pictures like, uh, well, it's just the sort of silly, I don't know, let's, let's something like this. A goes to b, goes to c, and then c goes to itself. So a and b don't immediately map to the same direction, but under the square they do. So I still want to call them equivalent in this case. Here, k can be taken to be 1. There is not, nothing subtle about taking powers. But in other examples, it could be that you have to look at powers. So two directions are equivalent if eventually they map to the same uh, direction. And that can be read off from the diagram, from the, from the derivative that's of the map. Okay, so, so in our case, uh, th th this just says that A bar is equivalent to B bar. That's the only non-trivial gate. There are three gates. One gate is just A, one gate is just B, and, and then there's a third gate where these two directions belong. So in other words, I want to draw the, the graph kind of like... Uh, I think we've, we may have done, had this picture before. Uh, 
um, but like this. Right, so this is A, this is B. I'm, I'm drawing B slightly longer than A because B is longer. And, um, and here I have three gates. There, there is the gate A, gate B, and then A and bar and B bar form one gate. Okay, and now uh, to check that this is uh, an invariant train track, you know, how do you check that uh, legal paths go to legal paths? Uh, well, you only have to check that, uh, so to see that uh, F sends legal paths to legal paths, it suffices to check two things. So one is that um, uh, F of any edge is legal. And, and that's check, right? There's, a, there's, there's B and there's AB. AB is legal. So here's, here's A, B. That's legal. And second, that um, uh, distinct gates go to distinct gates. Distinct. This is really F star of distinct gates. Gates. Distinct gates. I don't know. I didn't. Do <laughs> distinct gates. You know, things that are not equivalent are not allowed to go to equivalent things. And that's kind of by definition of this. If, you know, if, if D and D prime are not equivalent, then when you apply F, they're still not equivalent, right? Because that's why I insisted on K being large here. So this is also always true by construction. And so it's easy to check that, that, that this is true, right? <coughs> Right, because if I take a, an arbitrary legal path, well, it will pass through some vertices, but at every vertex, by definition, these two gates are distinct. And so when I apply the map, F, well, each one of these edges goes to a legal path. So there's another legal path here, but it's legal here as well, because that's where, that's, that's where I have the, you know, I'm taking the image of these two inequivalent directions, so there'll be an inequivalent here as well. Does that make sense? In other words, once you check one and two, then this implies that F sends any legal path to legal path. Just by taking uh, images of edges, which are legal, and then, and then checking that at every vertex where two edges meet, you know, when you take the image, it's still legal there. And that's because of, uh, that's because of number two here. <coughs> and, and moreover, this is, this is then uh, stable under taking powers. Right? This, if I take f squared, it will still send legal paths to legal paths. Any power will do the same. Okay. So now um, I want to prove to you that uh, the, 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 that this number is the, actually displacement. There's no there's no point in outer space that moves less by this map. Okay. So claim d phi is in fact equal to log. 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Um, okay, so proof. Suppose gamma prime is in CVN, and the distance between gamma prime and gamma prime phi is less, so let's call that number capital D, for example, and suppose that that's less than log lambda log 1 plus square root of 5 over 2. Okay, suppose some point moves less. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it, it, through going, going back to the, you know, what these things mean, it, it, it means that there's going to be a, a um, you, you can realize, so then, so there is a, so then there is a um, difference of markings Right, f prime that goes from gamma prime to, well, strictly speaking, to gamma prime phi. Maybe uh, I don't know gamma prime phi. I mean, gamma prime phi is really the same as gamma prime with just different marking, and then and then you have a difference. There's some. Uh, you should you really want to think of this as gamma prime. You have a self map, just like just like f is a self map of, of the rows. 
So here gamma prime is some unknown graph with some maybe unknown marking. So there's a there's a difference of markings like this with um, with slope of f prime strictly less than lambda. Right? That's what it means because f prime is supposed to realize the distance which is less than log lambda. So the slope on every edge is going to be strictly less than lambda. Okay, so what's the picture now? Now we just have to use triangle inequality and get a contradiction. Um, what's the picture? Okay, so that we're in outer space and we have, we have our, our gamma that we constructed carefully. Gamma phi, gamma phi squared, gamma phi to the k. Oh yeah, I, I, there's, there's something I, I, I forgot to point out here. Well, okay, let's just finish this and then I'll point out. And then gamma prime is somewhere else. And it, it also has this kind of orbit. Gamma phi squared, gamma prime phi to the k. Okay. I'm, I'm going to estimate the distance between gamma and gamma phi to the k. For large k. Okay, so this is by the triangle inequality less than the distance from gamma to gamma prime. I'm going over here. I, I have to be careful with the order in which I write things. Plus the distance from gamma prime to gamma prime phi to the k. Plus uh, the distance from gamma prime phi to the k to gamma phi to the k. Right, I'm, I'm going this way, this way, and then down. By the triangle inequality, this is true. Now, uh, the phi acts as an isometry. So this term here doesn't depend on k. This is the same as the distance from gamma prime to gamma. This last bit here does not depend on k. And of course, the first bit doesn't depend on k. These are just some two constants. This middle portion, again by the triangle inequality, I can, I can go from here to here by, by these little steps. And each, each step is this number d. This is d, this is also d, right? Because I'm applying phi to this pair of points to get this pair of points. So the distance stays the same. Uh, so this is, less than, this is less than or equal than k times d by the triangle inequality. Um, on the other hand, I claim this is the part that I forgot to point out over here. This is the same as k times log lambda. So not only, does, not only is this distance equal to log lambda, which this we know, this, uh, but, but, but in fact, the distance, and, and of course this is also log lambda, but the distance from gamma to gamma phi squared is 2 log lambda, right? Because f squared is a train track map here. And so for the same reason, for the same reason uh, that, 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 that phi was, uh, you know, the, the distance between gamma and gamma phi is log lambda, for that same reason, the distance from gamma to gamma phi squared is twice that. Because now the, when I take the square, the slope becomes lambda squared. So the distance is log of that, which is 2 log lambda. Right? Yeah, so I should have, uh, so the, the part that, uh, yeah. So this is, uh, uh, this condition is stable under, I, I said it, but I didn't, I didn't quite say enough, undertaking um, positive powers. And so the distance between gamma and gamma phi to the k is equal to, well, log lambda to the k, which is k times log lambda for every k, you know, one, two, three, and so on, for any positive power. So this number is k times log lambda, but, but for large k you get a contradiction, right? So k, k times uh, log lambda minus d is less than or equal than this constant, the distance from gamma to gamma prime plus the distance from gamma prime to gamma. But th this number is positive, right? And so for large k, Koji pointed out that uh, reals are 
Archimedean, right? You can, no matter what constant, <laughs> for some large k, you get, uh, you get that this number is bigger than this. So that's a contradiction for large k. OK, so that means that the displa displacement is log lambda and not, not some smaller number. Um, and you also notice that this lambda is an algebraic integer. It was, it was root of a, of a polynomial equation with uh, integer coefficients, and the leading term is 1. So it turns out this is always the case for, for any of the, one of these invariant train tech maps. I, I don't think I'll get into that, but that's part of the, part of the theory. OK. In this case, you um, first realized lambda to get equations for lambda. Right. Is there uh, any? So this is how did I how did I think of this representative? Right. That's that's right. That's maybe that that's coming or maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. But that's right. That's not obvious, right? If I give you some arbitrary automorphism, uh, even deciding whether it's hyperbolic or parabolic is not easy. And if it's hyperbolic, it's not uh, it's not easy to find an element. In the but it, it is algorithmic, though. Okay. Um, I can um, maybe maybe just to let's see. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll just uh, quickly uh, finish the the example. Just um, so to finish, what's the picture? Um, I mean, I, I won't go through the, the all the details of this, but the, what what we have is so here's a picture of outer space, and and you have. Um, We, we found this point uh, that, that was uh, in the min set. So the min set is, uh, so if, if, phi is, if phi is hyperbolic, then uh, the min set of phi is the set of gammas, so that um, the distance from gamma to gamma phi is equal to d phi. Right, so these are it's, it's a set of graphs that realize the displacement, and we, uh, you know, we we started out by um, with with an with an element in the min set. This was some point. It was the rows, and the ratio of of lengths of the edges was lambda. So it wasn't the midpoint. It was closer to one side, right? Where the ratio is lambda, and uh, it turns out the whole min set is a line. In, and it's it's affine in e so each each simplex has a natural affine structure, and you can um, I don't know you can uh, you know the <coughs> there there's a point on on the, another side where it, that realizes the same ratio. In other words, the, if this is gamma, gamma phi is going to be over here. It's a point on on another side of the same triangle. Um, you can you can see that you know w one way to 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 interpolate between between gamma and its image is to fold, okay? So you you have a um, yeah. What does what does f do, right? So you, know, you start with this graph. This is gamma, and and this is somehow a and b, and then you want to go to another rows. This is supposed to be gamma phi, and and how do you what 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 does the map do? Well, it sends a to one of these loops. And it sends B around both of them. So somehow, we, what you're supposed to think about is, is that there is a fold here. You're, you're taking this bigger edge and folding it around the smaller edge. But you know, to taking you know, at time t, you take a, a segment of length t, and you identify it with a segment of length t here. And at the end of this, when t is equal to the length of A, B has folded all the way around. And and now it becomes a shorter loop. So this is what's left of B. And this is this is kind of a, and this is what's left of b. Uh, it turns out that's uh, I think b a inverse. So it's a rose with a different marking, and and that turns out to be 
uh, the, the, this point over here. And this folding procedure gives you, gives you a, a path within this triangle, because those are all theta graphs. All the graphs in between are theta graphs, and they uh, interpolate between these two graphs. And th they're, they're all on the min set. They all have a natural train track structure that's preserved by folding. You know, this, the, the, the turn that you fold is illegal turn, and it produces another illegal turn over here. Okay, so I, I, I won't get into the, the, this would take a lot of time, but just to tell you what, uh, co kind of what's going on. So the, the folding, uh, folding produces the, so let's see, this is left, right, yeah. So somehow, I mean, it, it kind of doesn't look like a geodesic in this picture because, uh, because it's only an affine picture. But uh, th this, this is one of, the, one of these pads that, that do uh, a, a left, right, left, right. So you, you, you enter this triangle and then you, you, you choose the right side. Well, then you enter this triangle and you choose the left side, and then the right, and then the, oops, the left. It should be, it should be over here. This looks more straight. <laughs> it, it's, so it, it does left, right, left, right, okay? And that's somehow because the, the one, 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 one is the continued fraction expansion of this number, one plus square root of five over two. So there's all kinds of number theory involved here. Because out, out F2 is really isomorphic. So the, in, rank two is kind of special because this is isomorphic to, to GL2Z. Two by two matrices with integer entries and determinant one or minus one. So uh, studying out F2 is really the same as, as you know, thinking about two by two matrices. That's why it's uh, much simpler than higher rank. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so I'm going to state the theorem. Um, that um, that we proved in this example. I mean, I did, I, yeah. But there is no difference. I mean, in the, the theorem is just, it's just an abstract version of the same thing. This is how you recognize that something is hyperbolic. Okay, so theorem. So suppose phi in out of n is represented as a self map f gamma to gamma, uh, where gamma is a Mark graph. This is what we really started with in the example, right? Gamma didn't have a metric, it just had a marking. Um, and so this is slightly more general. The, the train track uh, structure can be uh, defined only on the subgraph. It doesn't have to be on the whole graph, like in the example. And there is an F invariant subgraph. Delta in, in gamma, which could be the whole graph. And the metric L on um, gamma. So that, okay, one, the slope of f on any edge in delta is some number lambda bigger than 1. The slope of f on any edge in the complement is strictly less than lambda. And 3, there is uh, I want to say non-degenerate. So this just means um, at least two gates at every vertex. Non-degenerate. Um, okay, so this at, le at least two gates 
in every vertex. Train track structure. On delta. So that uh, F sends legal pads to legal pads. We also say that the train track structure is F invariant. Um, or that F is a train track map. So there, there's terminology like that. But that's what it means. It sends legal paths to legal paths. Okay, then okay, the conclusion is that then F is, uh, well, phi. F, phi. F, F represents phi. Then phi is hyperbolic. Uh, the displacement is, is log lambda. And, uh, and this gamma is in the min set. Okay, maybe a quick example uh, that, that, that's more general than the, our original. So let's say um, A goes to B, B goes to AB, and then C goes to C times the commutator, say A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So then um, <coughs> what I want to do is take, uh, on, on A and B, I want to take the, the same metric we had before. I don't know why I do it so big. I mean, the ratio is probably not that big. <laughs> but anyway, and then, and then I want to put uh, a very large number on C. So C should be much larger than A and B. And that's so that uh, the image here, the image path is less than lambda times the length of C. Right? No matter what I write here, it, as long as it's in terms of just A's and B's, if I, if I make C much larger than A and B, then uh, the slope on C, on the edge C, will be less than lambda. It'll be as close to one as I like. So, uh, so this, this, these conditions here hold, right? And on on delta itself, this is delta. Delta is just uh, a union b. On delta, we have the same picture as before, and the slope is lambda. You know, that, that's the, the same metric as we had before. And then on c, so on a and b. Same metric as before. And then C is much larger. And then the conditions hold. Right? The slope of F on any edge of delta is lambda, and the slope in the complement is less than lambda. And, uh, and there is an invariant reintex structure. It's the same one we had before. And so we conclude that this is hyperbolic. And this, this graph is in the min set. So this implies that, so the theorem implies that phi is hyperbolic. Okay, so being, being hyperbolic is not really having a train track structure on the whole graph, but on some invariant subgraph with the, these properties. Okay, does that make sense? And the proof is the same. I mean, you, 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 you do these triangle inequalities. And it's the so same. Why do you need the second condition? Hey, what about the second condition? Why do, why, why do we need the additional second condition? Oh, because I want to know. Uh, you, you mean, oops, sorry. <laughs> is, you mean as opposed to less than or equal? Maybe you can get away with less than or equal. But um, um, it's, it's possible that you can get away with less than or equal. But you don't want strictly greater than. Because you, you don't want any, um, you, you want to know that the, the, the distance between gamma and gamma phi is log lambda. And so if the, if the slope was strictly greater than lambda in the complement, then you, you wouldn't have this. Um, <coughs> equal to lambda is probably okay. Yeah, I think that's probably okay if it's, if it's less than or equal to lambda. But the point is, you can always find a, 
Uh, that's what the main theorem will say, that in fact, any hyperbolic thing has a representative like this, where this is triple less than lambda. Okay. I mean, this is, delta is really secretly going to be the tension graph. So by, by definition, uh, everything in the complement will have slope less than lambda. Okay. Yeah, so that's coming, yes. So that's, the, that's, that's part of the classification theorem somehow. Okay, so I'll state it. Um, and then we'll do another example of a parabolic small on this. So classification theorem. Okay. So th this is about hyperbolic and, and parabolic automorphisms. We already understand elliptic. Okay, so the first part is that every hyperbolic automorphism um, admits a representative as in the theorem, this, this theorem here. In fact, Every uh, gamma in the min set, the morphism phi, in the min set of phi can be approximated by one in by such a representative. It can also be arranged. that um, F, well, this, that's my representative here, sends um, vertices to vertices um, and all vertices have valence greater than equal to 3. The maximal slope is an algebraic integer. So, so this you cannot always do by approximation. I mean, in, in thinking about this example here, points on, on, this, on this line connecting the two roses uh, will not be sending, well, maybe one of them will or something. But they typically will not send vertices to vertices. Right? If, I, if I take this, uh, I take this, uh, graph like this, and then I fold it just a little bit. Then, then my new vertex is going to be some point that's just a little ways from the vertex, and it's not going to be sent, you know, to some other point somewhere in the middle of the edge. It's not going to be sent to a vertex. But if you if you work harder here, so this last part is maybe a little more more difficult because it's not by approximating. You have to move some distance. But you can always find a representative uh, so that vertices go to vertices. And then you can compute this lambda in this kind of the same way that we did um, just linear algebra you know, you know, in the example. You, and we get some kind of polynomial equation for, the, for lambda. And, and then that's going to say that this you know, lambda is an algebraic integer. But I, I, won't, I won't get into that. <coughs> OK, so that's the, that's, that's the first part. That's about. Uh, Hyperbolic automorphisms and the statement about parabolic automorphisms. Well, I mean, there's they're kind of they have these relative train track maps, which I also won't get into. But I'll just say that every every parabolic automorphism is reducible. Um, it admits, so what this means is that it admits a representative f from gamma to gamma 
uh, so that there is a a proper um, f invariant subgraph. Delta, which is non-empty and 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 has no contractible com components. Okay, so our our first example of a parabolic automorphism was certainly reducible. A goes to A, B goes to A, B. So this delta is just the A loop. This automorphism is also reducible, but this one is hyperbolic. Not every reducible automorphism is, is parabolic, but all parabolic ones are reducible. Um, so in, in, the, in the reducible case, one, one does, uh, uh, you know, you, on, on the subgraph you, you, can, you can examine the automorphism on the subgraph and you can, maybe on the subgraph it's, redu it's irreducible now and then you can find a, uh, so therefore it's hyperbolic and you can find the train track structure. And then in the, in the rest of the graph you can find something called a, a relative train track structure. So there are some more uh, technical um, notions of, of the of train tracks for parabolic automorphisms. But they all have something like that. Some so you know, you, you think of irreducible case as being kind of the pure case that you want to understand, and everything else is, is uh, you know, it's it's like, you know, if you have a, ma a block matrix, right? Then th what you really have to understand is the blocks. Um, it's kind of the same here. Okay. Yes. So the complement of delta is sent into delta usually, right? Uh, partially to delta, partially right. It's not so sent into the complement. That, that so that yeah, so this A, A and B, that they form an invariant subgraph here. But, uh, in this case, the complement is sent into the, can, uh, into the also. Partially, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like an upper triangular matrix, if you want. You know, it's like a... Right? So this is zero, but, uh, you know, it's A goes to itself. You know, A goes to itself here, you know, so, or, but, but here, this B goes to both A and B. Individual pieces, uh, even. Well, they're not disjoint like in the surface, so that's one of the uh, reasons that uh, out of n is more complicated than the mapping class group. In, you know, in mapping class groups, you you have you decompose the surface into pieces, and they don't have anything to do with each other. They're just uh, here. It's more like a, an upper triangular matrix. You have you have this kind of a, a piece at the bottom, which is invariant and doesn't see anything else, but but the next piece might map over over it, right? It's a um, now, just like here, this C maps partially over, over this thing. Yeah, that's why it's more complicated. The maximal slope is an algebraic yeah, integer? Slope. Or the, the, yeah. So this d phi, so lambda, but d phi is, is log lambda. So it's log of a of an algebraic integer. Okay. Um, so I uh, I think in the next hour we'll we'll try to prove the this theorem. Uh, but f for now I want to I want to talk about growth and and point out another example of a parabolic automorphism. So it turns out you can have elements that, that are right. One, they're hyperbolic, but the inverse is parabolic. Uh, that, that's that's a classification. If they're both, I, I don't think it really helps to know uh, about phi inverse. So the trouble is that phi inverse will look uh, completely different and will have some unrelated train track, maybe, which doesn't help. In, in so the answer is no. We don't we don't have a. I mean, in fact, uh, the, you know, it, it's not e even the question of whether an automorphism is parabolic or hyperbolic is not well understood. Yeah, there, are, there are examples of automorphisms where we, we don't really know. Um, we know they're reducible, 
but some reducible automorphisms are hyperbolic and some are parabolic. And so we don't, we don't can't, at the moment, we don't know how to decide. That's kind of a question. Um, okay. Okay, growth. Okay, so the proposition is that if if phi is hyperbolic and d phi is log lambda, then there is a constant C so that A for every conjugacy class alpha if I iterate it so K uh, I iterate it K times so here I'm, I'm thinking of alpha as being a, a, a reduced cyclically reduced word and I'm measuring the length so this is just the length of cyclically reduced word right it's a conjugacy class you're applying the automorphism to this cyclical cyclic word and then reducing it and then measuring the length that's what this is well this is greater than this sir it's less than or equal than C times lambda to the k times the length of alpha. So as you, as you iterate, uh, you know, you, at worst you're multiplying the length by lambda up to some uh, universal constant. And, and second of all, this is realized. So if there exists a non-trivial conjugacy class alpha so that the if you look at, you know, you, you also have the lower bound. Okay, so that's that's a consequence for growth. So this doesn't. It turns out this is not true for all automorphisms. For for the ones that are not hyperbolic, it could be false. Um, Okay, so um, so we're running out of time a little bit, but the, the so the idea here is that uh, if you have a so he, so here's gamma which is in the in the min set, right? So it, it uh, and and satisfies satisfies uh, theorem. So it's a representative like in the theorem, so the, with the train track structure on some subgraph, and you have a marking from the rows, and I can assume that um, that the marking is uh, is a Lipschitz function. What did I call it? Maybe I, I didn't name it. Okay, so this is the marking, and there is also inverse marking. Uh, so it's the inverse homotopy equivalence from gamma to R, and they're both uh, both uh, maps are are say K Lipschitz for some K. Okay, there's some K, so that both maps are K Lipschitz. Well, then I claim that, that, that C can be taken to be K squared. And the reason is that somehow lengths, you see, if I take a curve in R, and I'm, um, I, I, you know, its, it's length is, so if alpha is a curve in R, its length is this number that I'm interested in, this uh, um, length of the cyclically reduced word. If I push it over to gamma, uh, it, it, it might become a different curve, but uh, the length of the of the image curve is not going to be more than k k times 
what, what it was over here, because this map is K Lipschitz. And similarly, going back, the, so in other words, lengths um, are comparable. The lengths of curves in R and in gamma are comparable up to this constant K. And so if you, if you go back and forth, you can, uh, you, you know, it can be K squared, because you, you, you lose K every time you go back and forth. Okay, so up to these multiplicative constants, so up to universal multiplicative constants, Um, lengths in R and in gamma are comparable. So when I'm, when I'm proving a theorem like this, I don't have to work with, uh, with R. I can work with any representative I like, right, up to, you know, at the expense of making C bigger. But so now working, uh, working in gamma instead of instead of R, uh, the, the, the theorem is, the proposition is, is I want to say, obvious. Right? Because the largest slope is lambda, so nothing will grow faster than the factor of lambda. You know, if, in, in, in gamma, I don't need C. I just have this. When I apply phi, the length can go up by a factor of lambda at most, because that's the largest slope. But furthermore, there are legal loops in the subgraph. And they map to legal loops, so they grow at exactly the rate lambda. So you get this lower bound. Okay? So the top, in the hyperbolic automorphism, the top growth is always um, this lambda. Okay. So, example. Okay, so and then, and then we can take a break. And then we come back, we'll prove this theorem. Um, okay. Example, let's take uh, phi to be A goes to B, B goes to AB. That's our favorite hyperbolic automorphism. And now, now I want to do the same with C and D with, uh, with a slight change. So if I, if I don't make any changes, then this would be the, the automorphism, right? I would just have an AB part and the CD part that look exactly like the AB part. But I want to add um, a, a little A here. That's my change. Okay, now uh, what, is, what is the growth of C? So, so here uh, I, I, have, I have a representative where I take uh, AB to be small, so there's A and B. I take the usual metric on A and B where uh, the, the map is uh, train track maps, I have one and lambda maybe, and then I scale C and D uh, way high. So, so C, C is going to be, you know, C and D, C is going to be some large number, um, I don't know, M, and this is going to be lambda M, where M is large. So what are the slopes? So the slopes are lambda on A and B, and on C and D they're very close to lambda. Right, because you have to, you, you're, you're going to, you know, C is, is going, C has length m, and it's going to a, a, a path of length lambda m plus a little bit more. But if I make m huge, then this is, this, you know, the slope is going to be, so the slope uh, goes to lambda as m goes to infinity. So that, that says that d phi is, d phi is, uh, well, less than or equal than log lambda, right? That's what it says. Our goal is to show that it's not realized, because this is parabolic. So claim, and, and in fact, uh, in fact, it's also d phi is also greater than log lambda by looking at the subgraph. By looking at a b subgraph, right? There are loops in here that grow at exactly rate lambda, so you're not going to be able to make d phi smaller. Um, but the claim is that, so d phi is equal to log lambda, but the claim is that uh, phi is parabolic. In other words, you cannot do better than this. These are representatives where the slope is arbitrarily you know, close to log lambda or lambda, but uh, it, cannot, it can never be equal to lambda. Okay, and so the proof is by contradiction. So if 
phi were hyperbolic, you know, A would hold. A from the theorem from proposition would hold. In other words, nothing would grow faster than this, the, this growth here, just exponential growth with base lambda. But uh, I claim that that's not true, that, uh, that for example, C grows faster. Um, but the you know, phi to the k of C is, is approximately up to some constants. It's, uh, it's like k times uh, lambda to the k. So that's faster than just lambda to the k. Yeah, it's growing faster than, than it's supposed to. <coughs> and the, the reason to, to see this, th this is linear algebra. See, I can, I can write down this matrix. You know, he, here, there are no cancellations. So you can compute the length by looking at matrices. And the matrix that you want to look at is, uh, uh, so, this is the so this first column corresponds to A. It goes to B, nothing else. B goes to A and B. And then C goes to D and A, and um, D goes to C and D. So this is a, a block matrix like this. And um, so the point is that uh, uh, you know, like so analogy is if I have if I take a matrix like this, right? So what is and I take it to raise it to power k? What is it? It's lambda to the k, lambda to the k, zero. And this is uh, What is it? K lambda to K minus one, maybe? Is that right? Uh, it's lambda to lambda. Yeah, I think that's right. So, um, Yeah, so you see that, uh, I mean, this is the largest entry. You know, how, how fast does this matrix grow? It's not the factor, it's not by, this is not the largest, when k, k is big, the largest entry is this one. Right, up, up to a factor of lambda, which is much less than k, this is like k times lambda to the k. And it's the same thing here, except uh, yeah, it's not a simple number, but a whole matrix. But lambda here is just the, the largest eigenvalue. There are two eigenvalues here. One is lambda and one, one is negative. And uh, the, the growth rate of this matrix is also uh, like this. And, OK, but that, that part is linear algebra. And we're sort of out of time. So yeah, I'll stop. Anyway, that's, that's an example of a sort of a fancier example of a parabolic automorphism, where d phi is positive. Okay, so stop.